A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And our cases this week, a murder that I am calling the dirty Downton Abbey. Listen to this, a former escort who became a countess by marriage, insists that she should retain her royal title despite the fact that she's been convicted for the murder of her husband. You know, the one who gave her the royal title. She has served her time. She's out of prison. And now she's fighting to remain the countess. Is that fair? Is that justice? But first, it is a horrific case of domestic abuse and stalking. How a man, angry about a custody battle, put a tracker on the mom's car, hunted her down, and then killed her. The man has been convicted and sentenced, but somehow justice seems empty knowing that the one-year-old girl at the center, at the heart of this custody battle, has been left without a mother and a father. We are recording this on Wednesday, May 31st of 2023. Our guest today is Luis Bolaños, a law enforcement expert with more than 30 years experience, a private investigator, the founder of Get Bit Investigations. Luis is a frequent guest. He's a fan favorite. Um, he's a friend of the show. He's a personal friend of mine. And I love any day that is filled with Lewis. How are you? Hi, Anna. Wow. Thank you for that. That's nice to see you. Don't get to see you much uh, nowadays, the way uh, our lives are going, but it's, I, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and these cases, uh, wow. Right. Uh, um, what I humans know. can do to each other. And I wonder sometimes what folks have to do to lose their status as, as to being labeled as a human. I know. Why is it? You know, and I honestly, I do believe in the in goodness. I believe we have more good in this world than we have evil. I believe it. I know that you believe it or we couldn't show up to do what we do because it's so depressing. You know, I heard the greatest story this morning. I'm going to get into our cases, but let's start with some sunshine. This is um, a high school senior who was born in a jail in Texas. Her mom was in the jail and she is going to Harvard University. Love it. Love it. See? Right? Focus. focus Sunshine. Sunshine. Hope and sunshine. Okay, let's get into the darkness now. (laughs) I know. I know. There's got, there's, yeah, that, that was brief. The sunshine, the sunshine was brief, Lewis. All right. So our first case is out of Rolette, Texas, where a man has been convicted of stalking and killing his ex-girlfriend, all in an attempt to gain custody of the couple's daughter. Sickness, illness, what is wrong with people? I I don't know. We hear stories like this all the time. People never learn. Um, And I'm not sure Andrew Beard, as we'll get into, uh, has learned his lesson yet. No, I, I don't. And there was a lot of fear when Andrew Beard, who's 36 years old, was actually let out on bail after he was initially charged the family of the woman that he was accused at the time of killing and her friends, they were so scared that he had been let out because of the level of violence and the allegations. Right. A- absolutely. And, and I'm still, we'll get to that in more detail later, but I'm shocked that he got out on bail. I'm shocked that they didn't have a no bail on him, but it was an, an, an attorney that bailed him out. His bail was at one million, and when he started to apply for that bail, somehow the bail doubled to two million. That attorney still bailed him out. I, I don't know what it takes to be a flight risk, but he also had an aircraft. He was a pilot, and at that time they didn't know where the aircraft was. So it's just there's so many layers here. Privilege, yeah. privilege, right? It goes to yeah, privilege. Yeah. So Andrew Beard has been sentenced to 43 years in prison after he pleaded guilty to cyber stalking, using a dangerous weapon resulting in death and discharging a firearm during a violent crime and in the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Alyssa Burkett, who was just 24 years old at the time and the mother of their then one-year-old baby girl. Andrew and Alyssa were in the middle of a custody battle and... That apparently was the motive here. Reports indicate that Alyssa had been given custody of the child on September 30th of 2020. And that's important because all of this 
happens around that event. Right. I think it's just a couple of days later. Yeah. Yeah. So things had been very nasty between the two mm-hmm. with Andrew being the aggressor here. Now, that same month that Alyssa was given custody, an anonymous tip is called in to the local police department. The tip says Alyssa, who works in the leasing department of a an apartment complex, has been dealing drugs there at work. And so the police went to see Alyssa to talk to her about this allegation, this tip that's been called in. She says, I'm not dealing drugs. She doesn't even need a search warrant. She says to the cops, please search my car. Because she doesn't believe there will be anything in there. Right. Until there is. Until there is. How did that happen? How did that happen? Police did not charge her, right? They didn't charge her. And they were very suspicious because Alyssa told the police that she was in the middle of this custody battle, that it was very, very nasty. And the police started thinking, ooh, maybe, maybe she was set up by Andrew, but they claimed that there wasn't enough evidence to go after Andrew at the time. Police say they found five marijuana baggies, a plastic baggie of cocaine, a Taurus pistol with the serial number removed, and and $29 in cash. So I have a question for you as a former officer, Lewis, an investigator. Okay, so they find the drugs. That's not our, you know, that's not under dispute. But isn't everyone going to say, oh, yeah, that's not mine. <laughs> and somebody planted it there. I hear it all the time. So I want to take a step back. And I am I, I'm so proud of those officers who are taking their time and stepping back. Because as we're hinting here, it very easily could have gone sideways. And how many times has this happened in the past where those aren't my drugs? Even I, I have found drugs in the pants of individuals and pull them out of the pocket. <laughs> and they'll say, those aren't these aren't my pants. Right? <laughs> So, you know, kudos to them for doing excellent investigative work and probably going with a sixth sense thinking something's up here. So they took her statement or or her affidavit. um, They documented that for later, but they wanted to do further investigation. And because that, could you imagine if they would have arrested her on those charges in the middle of a custody issue? And that has happened before. Spouses have done this to the other spouse. That life, her life could have been changed forever. And oddly enough, she might be alive today if that would have been successful. He, but because he failed, his anger just started increasing and increasing and his loss of control and power. That's what this is all about. Yeah. Wow. It, it is amazing. I mean, that was so, uh, because I don't know that I would have believed her. It's plausible, right? It's plausible. It's plausible. Yeah. But she, there's something that gave her credibility. Yes. Right? Uh, they, and, and she's, you know, I mean, saying, yeah, please search it. Go for it. Right. Uh, that helps to be that transparent, even though she didn't sure. have to do that. So the following month, October of 2020, Alyssa was attacked at work. She worked at the Green Tree Apartments in Carrollton, Texas. She was sitting in her car when she was shot in the head with a shotgun. Despite how serious this was, the fact that she, even that she was covered in blood, Lewis, she managed to get out of her car. She staggered, was staggering toward the office where she worked. And when the attacker saw that she was not dead, was hanging on to life and might actually survive, the attacker comes back and then stabs her 13 times, making sure this time she will not live and she dies. Yeah, she dies, but boy, does she fight, take out a shotgun blast to the head, right? And it, by a sheer miracle, being able to keep your mental abilities going and your physical abilities and being able to exit that vehicle and try to walk toward help and put herself in a, safe, a place of safety. And that animal just hunter continued. He had already hunted her, but he continued his hunt and probably even more enraged when he first got there she's still alive very frustrating to hear very tough to hear very tough to hear and as we've said countless times on the podcast over the years in these domestic violence situations 
when you have someone absolutely determined to kill you, even with restraining orders, even in hiding, we've seen this happen. Sometimes the law cannot protect you from an insane individual who is determined, cannot think straight and will kill you. And that is, that's the scariest part that people have got to take this so seriously. Yeah, that's an absolute truth, right? You can get a restraining order, but it still is just a piece of paper and you can do as much as you can to protect yourself or to protect a loved one. But if that person has time on his hands, her hands. Yeah, so sad. So the attacker was described as being 6'6", 2", skinny to medium, medium build. The attacker was a white man who was apparently working, wearing very dark face makeup and a beard to look as if he would be black. And so that confused some of the witnesses because some witnesses said he was white, some witnesses said he was black, and it was all very confusing at the time. Plus, you have someone fighting for their life. Unfortunately, she didn't make it. So witnesses at the scene, including many of Alyssa's co-workers, told the police that Alyssa was in the middle of a contentious custody battle, that um, she they knew she w- was scared and had been threatened. Then Alyssa's mother arrives and tells police the same thing. My daughter feared for her life. This man was threatening to do whatever he had to to get custody of their their baby girl. So, Lewis, at this point, he would rise to suspect number one, I would think. Oh, I, I think so. And and back to him putting what turns out to be some type of blackface. He wanted to give the illusion that he was an African-American. The officers never completely believed that. They were, from day one, looking at other possibilities. Um, and part of that reason, because they were aware of this call that was placed earlier, I would say two weeks earlier, where he tried to incriminate her by saying she had narcotics in the car, selling uh, narcotics from the window. So their radar was already up. But once again, kudos to the investigative uh, team out there for not jumping on that as the only possibility. Um, And it turns out they were right. And before we get to where they found him and what he was doing when they found him, I think this is important for everyone to understand what was going on in Alyssa's life, in Alyssa's words. So she had set up a GoFundMe page to help pay for her legal battles in this custody dispute. So I'm going to read a quote from the GoFundMe account, which is now changed. The GoFundMe account now is to pay for her funeral and to help the baby girl because she has no parents now. Okay, so these are Alyssa's words. If you know me, you know how my life has been for the past year. Anyone who knows me knows I am a wonderful mother and try my best to be the best I can for my daughter. Since she has been born, her father has taken me to court several times in an attempt to take her away from me. At the beginning of August, he took it upon himself to keep her from me. He would not open the door per the court order, and I went over a week without seeing my one-year-old baby girl when I am her primary parent. At this point, I am scared for my life and my daughter's life. It has been made clear this man will do whatever it takes to cut me out of the picture, and I am worried what is coming next will be the worst. Yeah, she was very, very transparent on her GoFundMe page. And the thing thing that really grabbed me was uh, she also wrote, at this point, I'm scared for my life and my daughter's life. That's quite a powerful statement to to put on a public GoFundMe page as to what's happening in her life in real time. Um, You know, she she had, you mentioned earlier, and and this gets me, sometimes the system is just delayed for whatever reason, and it shouldn't be in these areas. But she had a right uh, to have a visitation a week earlier and was denied by the husband. This is how that's supposed to work. You have the court documents that says, I'm here to pick up right now. My daughter's right there. I want to know why that didn't happen. And the officers didn't either make an arrest 
uh, or at least uh, get the child and hand the child over. Why was there a delay? Or maybe she didn't want to cause that type of headache. She didn't need, need the frustration. She had other stuff going on. I mean, there's a balance of it. Um, maybe she thought that she would deal with this later. Under, uh, who knows what was going on? But that document should prevent those type of things of happening and set the tone early of who's in charge. And who's in charge? The court's in charge. Um, but all it did was add to her fear and give him more feeling of power and control because he won the battle that day. Yeah, he did, didn't he? So as part of the investigation, now we're back at the crime scene. We've heard from Alyssa in her own words, and now we're back at the crime scene. Police find that there is a GPS, a tracking device that's been placed, um, attached to Alyssa's car. And according to Alyssa's boyfriend, not this man, but her boyfriend, that he found a similar tracking device attached to his truck, and he told police that he believed Andrew was tracking them. I've seen these cases before. These are so dangerous, especially when the person is hiding from the abuser. That may not have been the case here, but this is this is not helpful. This is not a good thing. I believe this tracking device is what eventually led to the cyber stalking conviction stalking through tracking through this gps that he had uh, applied to the vehicles horrible just a horrible horrible thing and that they had shared um Alyssa had shared in court how surprised she was when andrew listed her address when he should not have known it so that was a tip off that something was coming or something was going on. So, of course, at this point, police are believing that Andrew is their top suspect and they go to his house. And at this point, it's about three hours after the murder. And Andrew and his current girlfriend are seen taking the one year old girl, putting her in his truck and then loading bags into the truck as if. They're going somewhere. Yeah. They're conducting surveillance on him. So because their flags are up already, they're conducting surveillance when they see that. Yeah. And from his perspective, not trying to get into this insane man's head, but he probably thinks, oh, custody. There's no no issue here. She's mine and I'm out of here. I'm taking the kid and I'm out of here. My problem has been solved. Right. I cannot get over how many times, and we do this over and over again on this program, when people think that murder is a problem-solving tool. No. And it's just part of the way this individual lives, that he's smarter than everybody else, um, but he left quite the trail behind him. Yes, he did. So investigators saw that he had, you know, he's getting in this F- uh, a white F-150 that didn't have a front license plate. So the investigating officers from the murder case are now, because they know this is not random. They know this woman has been attacked. So they're asking other cops to do a traffic stop. So what happens in situations like this? Because we hear this all of the time. Oh, the suspect was caught in a routine traffic stop, which I always say, bull crap. <laughs> right. Well, that one is obviously not routine. And the reason the officers, the detectives around the surveillance, relayed the information of no front plate to the patrol officers is because that's the probable cause for the stop. That's how you get into the vehicle, how you get it stopped legally. From there, you you build on that, which is what they did. Yes. And they found all sorts of things. So the officers asked if they could search Andrew's truck. And he said, no way you need a search warrant. And they said, okay, <laughs> we'll impound your truck. No worries. We'll get a warrant. And then we will search your truck. We will search your vehicles, your computers, your burner phone, all that stuff. So the following day, now we're up to October 3rd in 2020, police have their search warrant and they discover things like black hiking boots that had been cut into pieces and smelled like bleach. What is that about, Lewis? Well, it might be the shoes, the boots that he wore at the scene that stepped on uh, forensic evidence that he might have tracked back, put him there at the location. Um, they found they, a serrated kitchen knife, mm-hmm. a, a flathead yeah. screwdriver. Um, apparent makeup, brown makeup stains on the interior of the vehicle itself, 
uh, and partially burned makeup wipes with brown residue on them. So as, he was as fast as he could taking that stuff off. Right. Yeah. And remember, witnesses said they couldn't tell was it was the person white, was the person black. It was very confusing. And that's because he attempted to conceal his identity and he wore blackface. So <clears throat> this, this is the one of all of the evidence, of all of the evidence, this is the one that undoes me and I think is also so telling. Okay. A search of Andrew's home uncovered the script that the man had written when he called in the drug tip against Alyssa. So he wrote it all How down. That? That, that, that's an amazing piece of evidence to recover. And it might have been the final seal in his coffin. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, they also found right at the house. Uh, we're talking about the house now. Um, more tracking devices that were consistent with the type of tracking devices to recover from the vehicle. That's pretty big, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, the work boots, as you mentioned, the trash bags that he could that he used probably to try to dispose of these items. Um, the vehicle that was possibly used in the attack. The evidence within that vehicle was recovered. And, a, and I think we already talked about this, but the sing, a, they also found a single dark colored hair with what appeared to be blood on that. So he apparently used a different vehicle when he attacked Alyssa. Apparently they found an abandoned Black Ford Expedition not too far from Alyssa's work. The registered owner, though, was still someone else. And when the police went to the registered owner, they said, and this, she said, oh, well, I, I sold the car to a white guy who's about um, six feet tall. And he was wearing um, a face covering and a baseball cap. So they believe that that SUV, not the one that he was driving, that he had the baby in, that that's the one that he used as the vehicle during the attack and murder of Alyssa. So, um, and they found, you know, makeup evidence and all that stuff, stuff, all, more incriminating evidence. So on October 5th of 2020, Andrew turned himself into police after learning that there was an arrest warrant for him. And as we said, he was out on bail, made everyone very, very nervous then. In June of 2022, he pleaded guilty to cyber stalking, using a dangerous weapon, and all these other charges. And then finally, on May 24th of this year, he was sentenced to 43 years in federal prison. I don't even know that that's enough. Yeah, yeah. I, no, it's nowhere near enough. But back to something positive, I think the officers did in this after he was on bail. They rearrested him a short time after he made bail for gun violation, gun charges. And I think that they Al Caponed him. They found another outside issue because possibly of the firearm that they had found in his house during the search warrant um, and the silencer that was with it. They found some federal charges to bring him back into custody and to hopefully keep him there until he actually gets filed on it and until he's convicted. And ultimately, that's what happened. Yeah. And now, so by now, baby girl is what, three years old? Yeah. 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 That's that's real love of a father, right? No. No. Well, I hope he rots in, in prison. I'm sorry, but that's yeah. what I'm hoping for. No, I agree. I think we're on the same page with that. We are really taking a detour with this next case. This is from the south of France, and it involves British royalty and how an escort married into a very rich family got a, the title of countess and then the more serious title of convicted murderer for killing the earl who gave her the, ca the, the title. Well, that former lady of the night has done her time in prison, and now she's trying to figure out and she is fighting to keep her royal title. Okay, I know this is a very unusual case for us to cover, but it caught my attention because we talk about justice a lot and what's fair. And so if you have someone who's been convicted, has done their time, okay, you know, not a problem we see here in the States. We, we don't have royalty. We don't have these issues. I don't even know how these things are settled. But I found that the murder and the investigation was so fascinating 
And then when you piece that all together and then you ask the question, lady, have you lost your mind? Be grateful you're out of prison and that you're living the life in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've seen that before, right, Anna? When people, even after they're arrested and after they're convicted and after they get out, just do whatever they can to put themselves, insert themselves back into the limelight. Um, and that's what she did. Uh, she she is a piece of work. Um, <laughs> Yes, she I, I, is. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and he may have been an earl, but he also had his own issues going oh, on. Oh, he was a piece of work, too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and together, you know, you kind of understand why they married and for yes. different reasons. But man, what a what a crazy case. All right. So um, let's talk about this. So I'm calling this the dirty Downton Abbey case because... Again, if who who deals with earls and counts and we don't have these problems and mansions in the south of France. Okay, let's start with the murder of the 10th Earl of Shaftesbury in in 2004. 66-year-old Anthony Ashley Cooper went missing in November of 2004, caused an international manhunt. A very wealthy royal is missing, right? Right. And they're all related to each other in Europe. Every one of them, the house of this to the house of that. Right. So it's like every cousin is looking for this man. So his body is found five months later at the base of the French Alps. Okay. Very sad. I mean, we've lost a life here and this is horrific and this is tragic. No matter what, whether you are a person of means or no means, a life has been lost here. And this person was clearly murdered. They they knew he was strangled. They had, They knew. Okay, so the Earl, let's talk about the Earl and his life. The Earl of Shaftesbury was married three times. No big deal, very Hollywood. He was once listed as one of the 10 richest men in the UK. He inherited a lot of land, houses in England and in France. Wealthy, wealthy man, but he had a thing for prostitutes, escorts, whatever you want to call them, sex workers, depending on the time period. He had a thing for that, apparently had an alcohol problem, apparently had a drug. I mean, this is a man, debauchery, the Earl of debauchery. Right, right. Yeah, um, his sister was pretty public, um, the Earl's sister. And, and she said that he didn't start going sideways with these that living in the dark world with visiting strip joints and hiring uh, high-priced escorts and, uh, uh, and his drinking issues until after his mother had passed after his second marriage. He was married, like you said, three times, first time for 10 years, the second for 20 years, over 20 years. And that marriage produced two kids. And then he met- uh, Oh yes, he, uh, he met Jamila, the-, the <laughs> Right? And the widow, the widow Shaftesley, Shaftesbury, the widow Shaftesbury, as I call her. Yes. And yes. then things got uh, even worse. It got even worse. And later we'll get to it, but he starts working on his fourth marriage. Yes, and that's what caused the problem with the third wife. Okay, yes. so the third wife, the widow Shaftesbury, yeah. Jamila Ben Mabarak, was a former escort herself. Jamila was born in France. She was raised in Tunisia. She eventually made her way back to Europe. And by 1993, she posed for Playboy and then started working as an escort in the south of France. This is all according to the Daily Mail because Jamila has done an extensive interview with the Daily Mail much has been written about her because this case was covered. This was huge. First he's missing, then he's found murdered, and then she's arrested. I mean, it was a huge case in Europe. Um, but she has since sat down for this tell-all interview. So Anthony, the Earl, met Jamila sometime in 2002, in 2002, when Jamila was working as an escort and she was sent to the holiday home of the Earl. And that is how they met. Apparently, Anthony became obsessed with Jamila and wanted to marry her. So that year, the two of them married in the Netherlands. And upon the marriage, Jamila became the Countess of Shaftesbury. Another reason for the wedding, she was apparently pregnant. What I know you're dying to say a million things there, Lois. Oh, yes, I am. It's just, <laughs> it, there's so much you can, sorry, but there's so much going on up to this wedding. I, we have to talk about how they met. Yes. Right. So the Earl had a madam who ran a 
high priced escort business. And he would, she, she would consistently supply him with women. One of the ladies that he had supplied him with was Jamila. And Jamelia also had a request through Catherine Gutler because she had done a lot of work for her, escort work, um, is that she wanted her to set her up with a very wealthy, famous individual that she could marry and settle down with. And she did. And in everything I have read, you're talking about the Daily Mail and all the news articles and all the, uh, uh, the uh, reporters that I saw report on this. I never saw one reporter or one article, anybody mention trafficking. The Earl was involved in trafficking. And to me, as you know, that's real personal on, on, on a lot of the work we do. Mm -hmm. um, that's the nexus, the starting point for all this. It started with trafficking. So from the, the madam to the Earl supply and demand um, and Jamila, who was happy to be available for it. Um, there's a lot of lives affected by trafficking. And I can't believe that this gets shoved under the rug somehow and hasn't been mentioned one time in any of these stories. Nowadays, it might be a little different. That might be at the very top where yeah. the conversation starts. This is a well, trafficking case that's led into a homicide. It is, whether it's going to be at the highest level, meaning where people are paying a lot of money and there are a lot of wealthy, privileged people who need to protect their identities and what's going on. And then the women or men who have been brought into this line of work. Yeah, it is dark, whether it's all the way up here because you're rich and you're royal or you're down here and you're working on you know, finding someone on a street corner or through Craigslist or on the internet or whatever. Yeah, it's the same horrific, dangerous life. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so that is the world that the Earl was living in, except we're getting a glimpse into how the rich do it. Right. And you're right, back then in 2002, 2004, that was not where the discussion was headed. Right very different times now. Same crimes, though. So according to Anthony's will, and you know, we're getting a lot of information as well from Jamila herself in this interview, because the Earl's family has made some comments. Right now, they're not addressing the whole thing, how she wants to keep her title. We'll see how this works out. So according to the will, a week before the couple married, Anthony added Jamila as the benefactor to several properties, not the whole thing, but some. He also reportedly bought her a $500,000 apartment in Cannes and then a monthly allowance that would be between eight and $10,000, depending on where you are in euros. So they marry. And two years later, the Earl is up to his old ways again, drinking, Cocaine, bringing back sex workers, really pissing off the countess. Okay. Yeah. It, and I, I just have to wonder, Anna, if this isn't something she signed up for from day one. Oh, please. She come on. It was a part of the package, you know, because she sure gives the appearance, especially with her latest interview, that this is new to her. You're what? You're into prostitutes and escorts? Uh, oh my, that's unacceptable. Well, how did he find you? So, I mean, it, yeah, it's always like when people have affairs, right? You, you cheat on your husband or your wife, you marry the person, you divorce, you marry the person you had the affair with. Oh, and what a surprise. Now they cheat on you. Police. Hello, karma. Yeah. Right? Okay. So how she didn't know what she was getting herself into is ridiculous. You know, and how she claims how this was all so dangerous Please, you were living the dangerous life before you said I do to the millions of dollars. So according to Jamila, this is when everything turns really sour. Jamila says, Anthony, the Earl, became obsessed with another escort and he wanted to marry this escort and leave Jamila and divorce her. And as part of the divorce, he also wanted to cut her off financially. Like, we've only been married two years, whatever. Ah, uh, what a surprise. This is exactly when the Earl is killed. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the times are a little bit blurry on that, but, but it sure looks like he didn't meet this. 
and this wife, potential wife number four, Nadia Orch, until after he moved out from living with Jamila. The Earl has moved out. He's at a at a hotel. Jamila is trying to salvage a divorce settlement. Somehow she brings in her brother, Mohammed, to help. Right, Lewis? So the last time that the Earl right. is seen, he is seen leaving the hotel. He was he was at that hotel, Anna, and he, hours before leaving for his appointment with Jamila, he was at the bar, and per the bartender, he consumed in less than an hour six gins and one vodka. And then he took off to his meeting with Jamila. Well, after he went missing because family never heard from him later on that day, police eventually, within 24 hours, went to go speak with Jamela to see what happened. He was going to show up here for some type of meeting with you. It was at a flat that they had in the area. They're in Cairns. Um, and she said he did show up, but he was so intoxicated, had defecated and urinated on himself that I sent him away. And she stuck to that. They never, he never came inside. And that was the last time she said she saw him. Right. And when you say something like that, and the bartender can corroborate that the man had had so many drinks, was drunk, it's possible anything could have happened because all those things are true about his behavior. So um, I'm going to kind of cut through a, a lot of the back and forth and kind of get to what actually happened in the trial, because this case is so intricate. So many things happened. But essentially, the case, the, the case that prosecutors had here was that it appears that Mohammed, because they've both been convicted here, that Mohammed the brother strangled the Earl. And Jamila has always claimed, even when she went to trial and even since she's been out of prison, she's always claimed she didn't kill him, that her worst crime was that she didn't render help or call for help and that she helped transport the body. Well, that's kind of an accessory to murder, right? Pretty much. Absolutely. The definition of it, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't care whether it's French law, English law, American law, you kind of were participating. So she did continue to deny all of this. And and um, so he's missing for months. He's missing for months. And police are very suspicious because she's she's been in and out of a psychiatric hospital, apparently in the psychiatric hospital where she went in because she was so depressed because her husband was missing. Because remember, they're not divorced yet. They're not right. divorced. Her husband is missing. She has a breakdown. She apparently tells people in the hospital that, you know, that she was part of the murder plot. And then police were like, well, we can't use this if this is what she said in the hospital. Very complicated. But it, initially, she gets arrested. And then her brother gets arrested the next day by German authorities because, you know, everyone's in Europe here. So um, in the trial is when it's revealed what kind of surveillance they were doing on Jamila and her brother. So the brother and the sister finally go to trial in 2007, okay? And we will get to all to, to the end of this. French prosecutors allege that the death was not accidental, but that it was the result of a premeditated scheme targeting the Earl for his wealth. Authorities discovered that Jamila had transferred $150,000 to Mohammed's bank account one week after Anthony's disappearance. They were listening in on Jamila's phone conversations, Lewis. Yeah, absolutely. They got a ton of information through those wiretaps. Um, in addition to that, they also sent in Jamila's sister into the cell she was at to have a conversation with Jam Jamila. And she admitted in that recorded conversation that she actually paid her brother $150,000 to get rid of of the Earl. She claimed, Jamila claimed that the money she gave her brother was so the brother could buy their ailing parents a nice little house. Because that's the kind of people they were. Yes. That, that, that's how they rolled. And the brother, <laughs> by the way, who happened to be a gigolo in uh, where he came from, Tunisia. 
<laughs> you know, only when you deal with with royalty can you say words like gigolo and madam and yes. <laughs> otherwise, right? It's just not words we use otherwise. Right. So, um, yeah, that that just did not work. There was a lot of evidence. Plus, cell phone records placed Jamila at the Alps where the Earl's body was dumped and found. It took jurors two hours to convict these two. Yeah. Done. You're out of here. Done. Of right? Here. So they are found guilty of murder in 2007. They were both sentenced to 25 years in prison. Again, I think that's really, I don't know what's going on. That is just such a, 25 years is nothing for a man's life. The Countess appealed and she got a slightly reduced sentence. She got five years off. So she was released in 2016. The Countess yeah. is out. Boy, is she um, Yeah, it's interesting. One of the court documents I read, it, they were convicted for murder, but it also said in parentheses, by assassination. I thought that was interesting because of his political position and high profile individual. Um, but yeah, she got out pretty quick. Yeah, she did. She's out. So this uh, now, whether this is true or not, the Daily Mail says, but it is intriguing. She says while she was in prison, she asked the guards to bow to her and she wanted everyone to call her the Countess. I don't see that happening. Right? No, I, I don't see that happening, but it shows where her mind's at. Yeah. Totally, Go totally. On. So Jamila is now 62 years old. She lives in Zurich and is using the title of the Dowager Countess of Shaftesbury. Again, like straight out of Downton Abbey. The Earl's son, Nick Ashley Cooper, who is now the 11th Earl of Shaftesbury, has pledged that he will take whatever action is necessary to strip Jamila of her Countess title. He had said in a previous interview that the day he met his stepmother, he knew she was a gold digger. I yeah. was concerned. I, I don't know about that title. I don't think it's going to work. She may think, refer to herself like that, but what she did earn was the title of murderer, felon, and. Yeah. Not a nice person. No, it's no. Evil, really no. evil. Evil. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. evil. And, um, you know, still maintaining that her only crime was. That she didn't assist the Earl or she didn't call the cops or please give me a break. Um, so the the original question on this case, which is fascinating because it's just a different world, insight into a different world, but also the criminal process, how it follows quite typically with investigations like this, a missing person who, you know, um, having a divorce, there's a dispute. It's, you know, all very typical. Should she retain her title? She was married to him when he was murdered. So she never divorced. She's you the know, widow, the widow Shaftesbury. No, I don't think she should. a legal process where uh, the house can, can remove her from that, that title, take it away from her. It can't be the first time this has ever happened where that is a consideration uh, and has to be a, an implement for that. So I don't know. Uh, we will see. What, Anna, what do you think? Do you think that she is going to get remarried <laughs> and, and, and look over at the same type of targets and enter back and probably into the same type of stuff she was doing before? I pity um, the fool. I pity yeah. the fool. Yes. Hopefully they do a background on her. Yeah. Yes. Please at least read the Daily Mail. <laughs> at least. Yeah. Well, it is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about. Our producer, Will Updike, is here. And Lewis and I just saw Will for the first time. And we're like, whoa! For those of you who are listening, Will is like rocking a Billy Idol blonde platinum thing going on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been listening to a lot of David Bowie lately. So uh, <laughs> I'm in my station to station era. Um, oh, we got a great case for you this week. Uh, <laughs> this one is about a roommate food dispute that allegedly turned violent. This case comes out of Louisville, Kentucky, where police arrested a 64-year-old man for allegedly shooting his roommate because he ate the suspect's last 
hot pocket. Now, according to reports, this all unfolded on the night of Saturday, May 20th, where our suspect here, Clifton Williams, became upset with his roommate after he learned that the roommate had consumed Williams's food. So Williams allegedly threw tiles at the roommate. The roommate is remaining unnamed here. And the roommate attempted to defend himself. I don't know if they were in the middle of a remodel or what these tiles were doing there, but he's dodging tile tiles. And then according to reports, the roommate starts to exit the home, trying to get out of this situation. But as this roommate tries leaving, Williams allegedly grabbed a gun and shot the roommate in the butt. So the victim reportedly escaped out and made it several blocks away where uh, this roommate was actually able to receive some help. He was taken to the University of Louisville Hospital where he was treated for non-life threatening injuries. So luckily, n- nothing too bad ended up happening here. Uh, and our suspect here, uh, Clifton Williams, was arrested and booked into the Louisville Metropolitan Department of Corrections on the early hours of May 21st. So unfolded pretty quickly here. Now, uh, apparently, Williams has pled not guilty to one count of assault. A judge set his bond at a mere seventy five hundred dollars and said that he could not have any contact with his roommate. Not sure where he's going to be staying after all of this unfolded. Um, but yeah, an extreme relax, uh, an, an extreme reaction to a hot pocket here. Ali K wanted to know what flavor, though. And I, I, I got to say, when I think of Hot Pockets, the first thing that comes to mind is is always like the pepperoni pizza one, which no, to me- No, the chicken vegetable one. No. Chicken vegetable? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, when I think of Hot Pockets, I think of the comedian Jim Gaffigan. His oh, absolutely. on Hot Pockets is phenomenal. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But I I would say, you know, in any event, probably not worth shooting somebody over. Although a lot of people in the comments could really identify with the suspect here. I think we've all had those sort of roommate disputes uh, or possibly even disputes with your loved ones over food uh, taken over in the fridge. Uh, Lewis, who I hope is is not you, said not all heroes wear capes. Um, I'm not sure about that one for this guy, Uh, but I I don't think that was you. Right, Lewis? No, sir. (laughs) (laughs) But thanks and thanks for thinking of me. Yeah, absolutely. Black Eagle said, hey, I used to label my leftovers. You eat, you die, which is yes. a fair warning. It's it's yes. unclear. It, it's unclear if the suspect here had written his name down on the food, because I do feel like you, you, you know, that in helps. terms of. Yes. Yes. And in terms of a, a roommate. As evidence, dispute, just pure evidence. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You have a box of Hot Pockets labeled. It, it could not possibly be any more clear. What's, what's also unclear from this story is, you know, does this roommate also buy Hot Pockets? Because then I could understand a little bit of confusion because uh, there are some groceries that only one roommate buys. And then, you know, you have a case. Yeah. But if, if things get intermingled, you know, it can be a it can be a pretty messy situation. Canadian trucker said I uh, had a warning for the next time this happens. They said the next time, Billy Bob, I'll put some buckshot in that other cheek boy, uh, which I, I you know, hopefully I, I don't think these guys are going to end up uh, uh, sharing a room together again. Uh, but uh, we, we had one comment where they're looking ahead to the trial here. Rad Racing said all he needs is one hot pocket lover on the jury. Um, I, I yeah, I don't know if. I I don't know. I, I just don't love any food enough to shoot someone in the butt about okay, it. Okay, can I tell you a funny story? A re- this is a true story involving food and people who steal from refrigerators. And you know, this happens a lot in office environments, right? You oh, have yeah. the communal refrigerator and things disappear no matter how you label them, no matter where you put them. So I was working where this would have been a Channel 4 in Los Angeles. This is actually hilarious. So the main refrigerator many people were complaining that their food was disappearing. Like they're, the food that they would bring for lunch or if they had left it in the refrigerator overnight, it was disappearing. So someone, it's a news organization, someone set up a hidden camera <laughs> to, figure out, did. to figure out who was taking the food. And it was one of the night editors. <laughs> of course, they thought they wouldn't get caught. They thought they could get away with it. Food stolen from local reporters coming up at 10. Uh, I mean, it was the writers, the managers, you know, because you didn't have your own refrigerator. Oh, I thought that was just so hilarious. And I swear to you, that person who I will not name like forever could never live that down. Like that person had a nickname. It was just always such a disaster because that person was the stealer of food. I think that's been the nicest thing about like remote work is that you don't have to share a fridge with your coworkers. 
Yes. Much more sanitary, <laughs> much more sanitary. I don't have to know about like what weird thing you're eating for lunch. I, I don't have to worry about my stuff being gone. It's um, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, but yeah, uh, that's going to do it for this week's comment section. Thank you so much to everyone who left those comments. You can do that over on our YouTube community page. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and TikTok. So, uh, that'll do it for this week. Thank you all so much. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Will. Care, will. Thank you. So I have a couple of shout outs, Lewis, before we get to our goodbyes, because we have such a robust community here, as I call them, the crime family. So Angel Hux on Facebook uh, sent me the greatest message ever and photo. I'm going to see if we can post the photo. Um, So I always ask people like, how do you watch us? How do you listen? I just love to hear people. So anyway, Angel has a chihuahua named Helen. (laughs) And Helen is very cute. Helen's a rescue and was born deaf. Okay. But Helen watches us on YouTube. And Helen is so cute. She's like white with apricot ears and freckles on the nose. And apparently, even though Helen cannot hear, her um, angel says that when a bad person, like the person who is the killer or whomever in this case, when they come up on the screen... Helen growls. I'm just um, saying. That's six cents. They, they, they can Arr. tell you bad. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. that not the cutest? So uh, always trust the Chihuahua. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was yeah. so sweet. So thank you for that. The cutest little dog I've ever seen. And then a, a shout out, a quick shout out to Pamela H. Uh, just celebrated a birthday. Pamela has been with us for years. Pamela got through the pandemic with us. She's one of our core crime family members. So huge shout out and happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday. to our Pamela. <laughs> I've never met any of these people, but I feel like I get to know them week to week. You know, last week, someone, I responded to someone on YouTube and they, and they responded. They said, you know, you say that you're the one who actually responds. So I'm going to believe that it's you. I'm like, yo, it's me. I don't have people. People, people don't respond for me. Oh, it's you. Oh, it's me. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. Oh, Lewis, where can people find you if they need a do-gooder like you to help them? <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, you can find my entire social media footprint at getbitinvestigations.com. And that is me, straight to me, nobody else. That's right. I'm Anna G, Anna with one N. I post mostly about foster dogs or my volunteer efforts, a little bit about crime, but I need a break from crime people. So I don't always post about it unless it's a really big case. So of course you can find this episode and all our episodes, wherever you get your podcasts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, of course called True Crime Daily. Receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, Don't do crime.